anticipating the, the decision on affirmative action is our subject uh, today. What does it mean to the education of America? Here on Community Matters, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and our special guest is Vernon Shah, an attorney who has been through a lifetime of practice and who graduated from Harvard Law School and who is interested in affirmative action and the issues before the Supreme Court today. Welcome to the show, Vernon. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you for having me. So we have a picture of the Supreme Court, and on the edifice there, it says, um, it says uh, equal justice under law. And that would mean, at, a, at, a, at least a superficial level, that everybody gets treated equally. So if I say everybody gets treated equally, then maybe affirmative action is not equal. Uh, how do you reconcile those two things? Um. I think affirmative action is an effort to balance or rebalance a situation, in this case, race. Um, it, it's an effort to uh, correct a prior wrong, uh, such as um, the Blacks or the uh, Native Americans. Um, who have may, may have been disadvantaged in the past and giving them a, a leg up by putting them into places like schools or colleges. Um, it's an effort to, for social engineering, so to speak. Yeah, social engineering, balancing, rebalancing, taking a look at the last 400 years and seeing what we need to do to the product of that 400 years uh, to make a balanced, social, equitable arrangement in this country. You know, I, I would say that we don't have that, and it's up to the Supreme Court to help us go there. Um, but um, all indications from reading about the arguments are that um, they're, they're not likely to uh, respect affirmative action. They're likely to Strike affirmative action. Um, what, what's your uh, expectation about this case? Well, I, I would agree with you in reading the evolution of cases um, over time. Um, I, I would predict that you're correct that. Uh, Affirmative action will be knocked out. In other words, in other words, race will be um, erased as an affirmative action in um, in educational settings. Yeah. And there was a. I was telling you before the show. There's an article in the Atlantic today. Uh, the author talks about violence in the in the in the country and the remarkable increase in violence we've had in so many cities. Uh, even, you know, this past week, we've had uh, three or four um, mass murders, and the number of uh, incidents is increasing, and it's spreading all over the country. And, and the, um, the author uh, reminds us that we're not going to be able to solve this superficially, that we have to deal with this de facto segregation, particularly with respect to um, you know, African-Americans, but all groups in this country before we can start to tackle the, the question of this increasing violence. So it's, it's beyond looking at guns. Uh, it's a matter of finding a social balance, as you said. Um, do you agree with that, Arthur? No, I, I think a lot of what's going on today is a reaction. It's a rebellion. And so how do you strike a a balance. And I guess the issue here also is, is this to be determined by laws or by interpretation by the judge on what is appropriate uh, social engineering for, in this case, let's, let's stay with race, that race is, uh, is the issue. Is this something acceptable where the court should make a decision or is it something that the, the public should, the, the government uh, in law should be making a decision on? 
is there been too much emphasis on affirmative action and this is a this is a rebellion against that. I noticed that in many of the cases that you had pointed out, and I didn't realize this, um, after the decisions on affirmative action in colleges, um, many of the states, I think there's eight states, nine states, that have come out with uh, laws, including their own state constitution, banning affirmative action. That that, uh, that affirmative action by laws or by governmental fiat should be removed. And so I think uh, that raises further complexity to the whole situation. Um, and looking at the cases, uh, they <clears throat> the, the arguments seem to be made, including some of the judges, that if you remove affirmative action you cannot adjust the social imbalance adequately without taking race into consideration. On the other hand, some of the tests that have been uh, coming out are so broad that uh, it, you know, it, it becomes unsupportable as to how you handle race without calling it race. It, it's a real enigma. Yeah, I think I think it's clear uh, even from some of the um, the decisions that if you if you strike affirmative action, um, you're striking more than the social balance. You're striking, you know, the careers and the leadership of the nation. In other words, um, you know, without giving Harvard too much credit, I think it's fair to say that the leadership of the nation. Uh, comes out of the best schools. And if Harvard is, you know, one of the top schools, um, then, you know, the leadership of, of industry, of government, um, industry and government and all the other places we find leadership in the country uh, comes out of those schools. And if you don't give an appropriate measure, uh, if you don't allow African Americans, for example, to attend Harvard, or as many as have been the case, uh, then you're ex excluding them from the future of the country in, in terms of leadership. And I think uh, that I think that's pretty clear um, because there won't be as here's this: there won't be as many African Americans at Harvard when you strike affirmative action. I think that's true. I remember I was in the service. I was in the Coast Guard and during Vietnam, and somebody decided, I guess it was during the Johnson administration, um, that uh, the Coast Guard did not have enough African-Americans, and, and we had to fix that. So uh, there was a directive came from Washington within the military, said you will now uh, commission X number of black officers into the Coast Guard. Um, because there weren't enough in somebody's opinion, um, you know, in the administration at the time. And, and Coach Scott did that. It was not painful. It changed the complexion, literally, of the Coast Guard. And now the Coast Guard was a, a more fair representation of the country. And the leadership in the Coast Guard, you know, was a more fair representation of, of the, the color of the country, so to speak. And so um, it does work. And it does mean that leadership can be from all sides. And the average, the average black citizen can say, I have a chance here. I have an opportunity. I'm not being held back. I'm not be, being sidelined. And I, I suspect that the same thing happens with affirmative action uh, outside the military and, um, you know, in, in the colleges, in, in the colleges that are willing to do it, in well, the that states that are willing to let the colleges do it. How did it work at Harvard? You you preceded affirmative action when you went to school, right? Yeah, so the, I think the argument you just gave is exactly the argument that was uh, put forward by Harvard or the Solicitor General saying that, that you need to have, to make a better society, to make a better university, you need to have affirmative action to have more blacks and Native Americans there. And, and the only way you can do it is by considering race. 
Um, that certainly is a good argument. The problem I think that most of us are having is who should make that decision? Is it the, the laws, the legislature, the court, um, or the university administrators? And how do you socially engineer uh, the situation? You know, should you have 50% blacks at Harvard rather than 20%? Who makes the decision on the percentage? Um, and if it's blacks today, is it Native Americans tomorrow? Is it lay and lesbian uh, LBGT people the next day and then Micronesians the next day? How should the government or the college administrators get you know, get into this field and, and, and how do they do it? I think Harvard now does it as sensitively as, uh, as one can by saying it is only a consideration, a factor that they can look at um, as distinguished from the Texas case, which was just four years ago, where they say actually that uh, they need to have more blacks at Texas or minorities or um, having society or the military or the, you know, uh, the business community more uh, attuned to racial, um, you know, dealing with racial disharmony. Uh, it, it's, it's a very complex issue. I don't, I don't know how the court's going to come out. Well, I, I, I suspect the court with, with in this case uh, is, and, and that's another uh, enigma to me. If the law is correct that there should be more attention given to minority race, then why should it change when the Supreme Court justices change, you know, from five years ago to the current time? And I think the prediction now is that um, you're right. I think they're going to strike down affirmative action, even in, a, in the Harvard sense of making it just one factor of consideration and not a not a quota. But does that make sense that you know today with this new court, affirmative action is not good, but five years ago with the prior court when Ginsburg was there. Um, it was a good thing to do. How do you reconcile that? Well, I don't think you can. The fundamental thing is racism. I think it reflects that this conservative court is racist, and it's it's going to pop up wherever it pops up. Um, and uh, you know, it, I, I can I can see racism in the Dobbs decision too. That decision is um, you know is, is based on accentuating the disparity. And this will accentuate the disparity, too, when they make that ruling. The other thing that troubles me is, we're, you know, we're talking about the new federalism. And the new federalism is you, you, you take a federal position on things when it suits you. And when it doesn't suit you, don't take a federal position on things. Um, so, for example, you say, well, we want the states to decide um, about abortion. Um, but uh, we are going to let them, in fact, encourage them to do that. Um, at the same time, uh, why, why can't the states decide affirmative action too? Uh, some states, some, some of those colleges you mentioned, which have set aside affirmative action, they did it because the legislatures in those states, which were supporting those schools, said you can't do it anymore. So in that case, the states decided. But here the Supreme Court is, is on the brink of deciding by itself. So where is this? Is it federal? Is it state? Is it a combination? How do you know? And, and therefore, you have to look beyond that, I think, and look at their real goals are. And their goals, in this case, I believe, are uh, racist. So the other thing you mentioned that I like to dwell on just for a minute is this is very complex. It amounts to an algorithm. And an algorithm has so many variables and so many tests and so many confirmations within the formula. Um, if you wanted to write a, an algorithm about how Harvard or North Carolina does this sort of thing, um, it would be complex. And uh, is the Supreme Court saying they want to get into that? 
uh, they want to be involved in writing the algorithm. They, they have no capacity, zero capacity to write the algorithm. Uh, and then when they finish, you know, there'll be the, the whole question of legacy, where Harvard has a special category. You know, you can have an advantage if you apply, if your parents or grandparents or uncles and aunts went to Harvard, uh, which I always really wondered about. So when the smoke clears on affirmative action, there still would be legacy. There will still be an algorithm, but you pull race out of the algorithm, and therefore you you know you pull the possibilities, the opportunities of the African Americans and, as you say, the indigenous people uh, out of the formula. So the Supreme Court would be writing, or shall I say, rewriting the algorithm in in this in this decision that we expect from them. Um, shouldn't they leave that to the schools? Shouldn't they leave that to the states? Um, and finally, let me, let me say this. A lot of this is subjective, isn't it, Vernon? It's subjective on the part of a few administrators who are handling admissions. And that's not going to change. And so when they see a photograph, for example, of an applicant, they're going to consider it, whatever the Supreme Court says. The problem is it will be irregular. It would be subjective to the point of each, each admissions officer on his own or her own. So I, I see chaos coming out of this. What do you see? I, I think that is probably the case. Um, but I think you need that because I think the kinds of discussion we're having today is important to take a look at and, and to evaluate. You've raised the issue of federalism versus the state action. Um, I think there's another denominator, and that is whether either of them should get involved and whether, and whether or not it should be the, the people, the individuals. Look at all of these cases now. We have to go back to why the Supreme Court is there, and it is specifically on the 14th Amendment that the state cannot... Um, discriminate either in enforcement or in passing laws, and the state cannot uh, treat the population equally. So going back to that test, um, I think one needs to look at the underlying uh, treatise as to whether individuals should make that decision rather than the college administrators or the legislature or the Supreme Court. Um, let me raise another issue that I think on this complexity, should Harvard be any different than North Carolina? North Carolina is a public school. So you can get the, the 14th amendment there. What is the application to Harvard? It's a private school. Shouldn't they make, be able to make their own decisions? Um, but they, Harvard does get federal funding from grants and such. So is that enough so that they should be treated the same? Yeah, it's more, very clear. More questions. More questions. More questions. And, you know, I don't, I don't think the, the Supreme Court, especially the conservative majority, uh, has the capacity to wrap around all of these issues and come up with a fair decision that applies policy, um, you know, across the whole country. Uh, and I feel that what they're going to do is going to make a mess is what's going to happen. That's my own prediction on it. But let me ask you this. You know, we talk about the African-Americans. We talk about the indigenous, the Indians and whatnot. Um, but we haven't mentioned the Asians. And, um, you know, a, a lot of the people who have the benefit of affirmative action, at least theoretically, are Asian applicants. On the other hand, there are people who say, well, the Asians, they study hard uh, like you. And they do well in school, and their applications are impressive. Uh, why do we need to give them affirmative action? Well, if anything, this is where I think very cleverly the plaintiffs in the Harvard suit is raising it on behalf of the Asians, saying that you are now being discriminated against. The Asians at Harvard are viewed the same as the white people in the in the Baki case or the Bollinger, the Michigan case, or the Texas Fisher case, they've turned it on their ear because they're saying now that Asians, because it 
fits the mold of good school, good grades, good um, SAT national exams, a lot of extracurricular activities. They've learned the formula and therefore they should get in ahead of the black who may have less criteria. And so I, I think it's very clever the way they've raised this. It really is an Asian issue at Harvard. I don't know about North Carolina, uh, but then therefore they're saying, should race be a consideration at all? Uh, it's my understanding at the California school systems now that um, the, the Asian, the Chinese, Japanese, Koreans uh, are far in greater proportion at the University of California schools uh, than their proportion in the in the population, and that I think is in part with the uh, the state statute that they they can't that they banned affirmative action. Query whether the same would not be true at Harvard if uh, that were the case. Well, and then there's this the whole notion of these. There were two cases. They're probably going to be split. Um, because um, uh, Justice uh, Jackson has uh, recused herself yes. um, on one of them. I guess it's the Harvard case. She'll sit on the North Carolina case, but not the Harvard case. So there are two separate cases now, which sounds right. I mean, recusal is something the Supreme Court seems to have forgotten about lately, and good for her. Um, but um, what I get is there's two states involved, two educational, two educational environments. But there's, a, there's another, you know, thousands of colleges around the country um, that this decision will affect or directly or indirectly. I'm not sure how. And I wonder if you have a sense, let's assume for a moment um, that the Supreme Court decides no more affirmative action. You, you must be completely colorblind in your um, admissions process. Um, how does that affect American education? I, I'm not sure how they're, you know, because in these various cases, there, there's been various tests that have been tried or issues. Um, for instance, in, in Texas, I think they definitely say race was one of the considerations, but the, that was for the 25% that were not automatically enrolled because they were in 10% or 7% of their high school class. Um, I'm not sure that anyone's gonna be clever enough to be able to figure out a way of getting to the disadvantage uh, without looking at this race issue. I, I, I just don't know. Well, it, let me uh, offer you, um, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a piece from the future, if you will, an issue from the future. Um, let's assume I'm uh, I'm white, and I see I see a school in which the admissions officers are de facto uh, giving a break all by themselves, um, affirmative action or not, and it would be against the law under this uh, you know Supreme Court decision. We expect. And I see an admissions office that is, in my view, giving a break to a minority group of some kind. So, and I don't get in. I do not get in, and I'm ticked off about it. So I sue. And I sue, and I say, this school is not following the law as laid down by the Supreme Court. They are favoring African Americans. They are favoring Asians. They are favoring indigenous people. Uh, they're violating Supreme Court's decision. Um, and here's some numbers. You know, I'm going to do a little discovery and, and find out what the numbers are. I compare the numbers against before, and I am suing the school. And I, I suggest to you, Vernon, that a lot, the people who have opposed affirmative action or uh, either the plaintiffs or representing the plaintiffs in the case now in front of the court are, um, you know, looking at it from a racist point of view. And there would be people all over the country who would Likewise, look at it from a racist point of view, and they would be suing all these schools where they suspected, right or wrong, uh, that the admissions officers 
were taking race into account. Wouldn't you expect a number of cases of um, litigation matters to arise from the decision we expect from the Supreme Court? I, I don't know how the courts would handle it, how they'd be able to analyze whether there has been discrimination or not. Um, you know, you raised a, another allied point was uh, the legacy students versus the, you know, I think Harvard now has a program where um, they favor a number of students who are, you know, first time in college, but parents uh, never went to college. So they're trying to reverse the other side. Um, as we go through this, it's going to be more and more complicated as to how the courts will even be able to analyze or how someone would be able to make an argument. All of the other cases so far, the Fisher, uh, the Baki, the, the Bollinger cases, all have specific, I mean, the admission officers were very candid about the situation. With Harvard now, um, what they say is that minority, race minority is a consideration, but it is only a consideration. It's not the definitive. So I'm not sure how someone can show otherwise uh, that they have a higher SAT score or that they uh, have a higher high school graduation score. Uh, it's going to be m more and more difficult to uh, yeah, and especially with the courts looking over, looking over the shoulder of the admissions officers on anything, and uh, this, I think I my 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 earlier point is is that this will open a channel uh, for examination and reexamination of what the of whatever algorithm the admissions officers use, uh, and it's not it's not healthy. Um, the schools ought to be able to have uh, some autonomy on the subject, in my view. But let me go to a larger a larger issue where. Where we have to, you know, close after a few minutes, um, and that is the Supreme Court itself. Uh, here we are. We know what they said. Uh, we know the recent background of their thinking. Uh, we know that they're they're a conservative majority. We know they have problems uh, about ethics and recusal. Uh, and the paper uh, in the past few days have been, have been um, critical of Samuel Alito for. And the possible leaking of um, not not one but two decisions for um, strategic purposes from the Supreme Court. So um, the um, the court is, is under attack, I would say. That and and public confidence in the court is at a low ebb. When you and I went to school, um, we had uh, ultimate esteem for the court. Right or wrong, they were the top of the line. And now I don't I don't feel that way anymore. A lot of people I know. Uh, uh, there was one lawyer, a, a district court judge, uh, who resigned from the Supreme Court. He was so offended by what he saw was going on there that was interesting. And he published, he published his letter of resignation. And so, um, and, you know, we've had talk about uh, packing the court. We have talk about uh, term limits uh, to less than life. Um, we have a lack of public confidence. At the same time, people seem to be saying that the court is out of touch. In its present configuration, it's out of touch with these um, important, dramatic, uh, profound changes that are happening in the country. And they should be in touch, but instead they're off in their conservative corner. And I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Um, how is the Supreme Court doing? What is the signal for the future about the, mm, uh, the respect the Supreme Court has, not only from the bar, and the, you know, the rest of the judiciary, uh, for that matter, the legislatures. What about the people? Yeah, Should I, we be feeling differently about the Supreme Court now? Um, yes and no. I, I, I'm prepared to give the benefit of the doubt to the, the justices and their respect for the institution. Um, as a, for instance, I was really... Um, interested and, and pleased to hear that Scalia and Ginsburg, who are about as arch conservative and arch progressive justices as there could be at the time, um, were extremely good friends 
socialized, went to the opera together, and had great uh, accord with each other. Um, I've spoken to Scalia, and uh, he confirmed that there was a real collegiality and that much of the the arguments or 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 distaste or what have you against each other uh, was manufactured by the media. So it, and it was not true. Um, I don't know if that is the case still today. I I'm willing to give it a benefit of the doubt and, and hope that that collegiality still still exists, even though these things that you've mentioned. Uh, the leaking of articles and so forth are are, are troubling. Uh, we'll we'll see. I, I'm hoping that the Supreme Court, um, as an institution, succeeds, especially because we have so much difficulty with the executive branch at this point. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll have to watch. We'll have to watch those uh, the, the opinions, and this particularly this affirmative action opinion. Um, so we we've guessed about you said Jackson was going to recuse herself from the North Carolina. I mean, just the Harvard, but not the North Carolina case. Yes, I'm not sure how she. I mean, they're so allied. I. Oh, uh, there's a different. One is uh, one's a private school, the other's a public school. Well, well maybe that, that maybe maybe on that. On that basis, I know for the Harvard one, she was on the board of overseers um, at Harvard. Yeah, that's the reason. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it'll be interesting to see if how that decision uh, plays out. If there are two separate decisions, and as you say, if she does the North Carolina suit, uh, that might be interesting. If you sat Vernon on that court, how would you rule? And what would your justification be? You know, before this week, and just when when you first talked to me about this interview, I would have said affirmative action. Um, keep affirmative action. Harvard's doing a good job on it. After reading all of the decisions, I could go. I'm fifty fifty. I don't know. I. I, I, my mind is open, and I'm willing to um, hope that the courts, with the admissions officer, will find other ways of uh, so-called balancing the uh, admission policies. Mm -hmm. I, I just, it's interesting. I think things have evolved. I, I think more importantly, if you were to take that and transpose it to Hawaii, what would the situation be on Hawaiian programs and Hawaiian admission and the requirement to have Hawaiians and all boards and commission? Is that is that a good thing or or or, or not a good thing? Uh, so I, I bec I've become a little more introspective in looking at these things uh, on the issue of of, of race. And also from my own experience of being one of five Chinese or Asians in a class of 526 back in 1956, to probably when my son attended uh, law school there, much larger percentage. And I think today the law school must have Asians, maybe 25% of their student bodies is Asian, probably disproportionate to the population. So I don't know. I don't know about well, Let me Let me offer you one thought. And that is, uh, we, we, we learned in a sense uh, from the Dobbs case that the devil can be in the detail. We know where they're going ideologically. Uh, we know what their fundamental concerns are. But it's how they say it, how they justify it, and the exact order they give. Because mm, Everybody in the country will be reading that. Everybody, everybody on every campus will will be concerned about following it or not. Um, and so um, it could be a relatively soft landing, or as I said before, uh, the possibility of chaos. 
you agree that the devil would be in the detail? I agree with you. Yes, I, I think it'll be very important how they craft the decision out of this. Um, you know, the the cases, you know, for instance, with the Fisher case or the the Baki or the the earlier cases have always been split. I mean, it's like four to three and. Uh, It'll be important how they rationalize it, because I think from an institutional standpoint, it's important that the Supreme Court uh, be looked at uh, as having a wisdom of being able to, to handle all of this. I don't know. The jury still out. We'll see what the decision comes out as. And um, I, on this one here, I think it's going to be a close call. Uh, Roe v. Wade, I'm totally against uh, the, that. Uh, that decision, but I think it's important that we respect our Supreme Court. Well, um, uh, I'm only sorry you're not on it, Vernon, um, but uh, you've made your choices along the way to practice law instead. <laughs> I, I would be somewhat comforted if you were on it, actually. I think you are an oracle of wisdom, and when, it, when the decision comes out, uh, I hope you'll join me again. Uh, we'll take a look at the language. We'll parse out exactly how they crafted it. And uh, we'll try to figure out how that will affect the country and education in the country. And uh, Harvard and North Carolina and every other school. I hope you'll be available for that. Thank you very much, Jay. I, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, and I appreciate being uh, asked. Thank you. Vernon Shard. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.